Hi, this is Mr. Beck. This is Magnetism Lecture 2 about electromagnetism. Lecture 1 was just an introduction to magnets and a little bit of the history, um, how compasses work, where magnetism comes from, and uh, magnetic field lines. So if you're interested in that, find Lecture 1. This is Magnetism Lecture 2. In this, in this lecture, we're going to talk about electromagnetism in terms of moving charges and magnetic fields. So we're going to see how moving charges create magnetic fields. We're going to take a closer look at the magnetic field near a current carrying wire. Introduce the first right-hand rule, indicate the direction of magnetic fields, how we're going to show that on a flat piece of paper, and then we're also going to talk about the magnetic field strength. Finally, we're going to be talking about how moving charges are affected by uh, an external magnetic field. So we're going to have moving charges flowing into a uniform magnetic field. We're going to introduce a second right-hand rule, and we're going to talk about circular motion induced by these uh, magnetic properties. Historically, the discovery that there was any connection between electricity and magnetism uh, started with Hans Christian Ersted in 1820. The story goes, and it's probably apocryphal, but the story goes that one of his students said to him, hey, what would happen if you held a, a compass up to that uh, wire that you're, that you're demonstrating? And he said, oh, of course, there's, they're not going to have any effect whatsoever. They're two completely different things, magnetism and electricity. Here, let me show you. And so when he connected the wire near the compass, all of a sudden the compass jumped. And so he was surprised, his students were surprised, and now, of course, instead of his student who asked the question getting the credit, Ersted took the credit. And so April 1920, he discovered that a current carrying wire did deflect a compass, as he put it nearby, and the compass is always pointing at right angle to uh, the direction of the current. So if the current is flowing in one direction, he noticed that that compass would, would turn and form a right angle to the direction that the wire was flowing. So that was an interesting discovery and that kicked off our understanding of electromagnetism. Let's take a look at the magnetic field that is generated around a current carrying wire. If we have this wire, in this case the current is moving to the right, what we discover is that the magnetic field lines are going to form circles around that wire. And in order to determine the direction of that magnetic field, whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise, what we're going to use is what we call the first right-hand rule. There's going to be another one coming up later. But in this case, you take your right hand and you hold the wire. You just grab onto the wire, uh, imaginary. You grab onto the wire, and as you line your thumb up in the direction of the current, what you do is you wrap your fingers around the wire, and the fingers will wrap in the direction of that magnetic field. So with the thumb pointing to the right, my fingers would be wrapping around. So on the back of the wire, here, this way, on the back of the wire, the, the, the magnetic field would be pointing in the upwards direction, then it would come across the top, and then in the front of the wire, it'd be pointing in a downwards direction. So that's what's showing here, as the, as the fingers are wrapping up and around the wire, we get the circles of the magnetic field around the wire. Now you have to use your right hand. So lefties, it's called the right hand rule, so make sure don't use your left hand, make sure you're using your right hand for the right hand rule. So that gives you the direction of the magnetic field around the current carrying wire. Now it's sometimes easier to show the magnetic field in two dimensions where we're only going to be dealing with the plane of the paper. So what we're going to do is we're going to use dots representing the field coming out of the page towards you. So this is in the plane of the paper around this um, current carrying wire. And then we're going to use X's to represent the field going into the page away from you. So if you see dots and X's, the dots are coming towards you and the X's are going away from you. And this is taking just the plane of the page and showing that the magnetic field is coming towards you above the wire and going away from you below the wire if the current is running to the right, according to the first right-hand rule. We call that the first right-hand rule. Um, now, one way to remember this is if you think of an arrow, if an arrow is coming in towards you, you're going to see the tip of the arrow, and so that is why we have circles up top. And if the arrow is going away from you, you'll see the X's um, as if you were looking straight down the arrow this way, you're going to see the, the fletching of the arrow, the, the, the feathers forming that X. So this is an arrow coming towards you, and this is an arrow going away from you.
In addition to the direction of the magnetic field, we're going to need to know the strength of the magnetic field. So this is going to be one of our first calculations we're going to do in the magnetism unit. The magnetic field you would think might be capital M because the electric field was capital E, but no such luck. The magnetic field strength is represented by the letter B. I don't know why. You can look that up and let me know sometime, maybe in the comments here. But the symbol for the magnetic field is B. And the magnetic field will depend upon two things primarily. It'll depend upon the magnitude of the current, and it'll depend upon the distance you are from that wire. So R is, is like radius. You're used to using R for radius, and that makes sense since the magnetic field is indeed going to be in a circular pattern around the wire. So it depends on the current and the distance from the wire. The equation we use is the magnetic field strength equals mu naught, that's uh, the Greek letter mu with a little zero, that's mu naught divided by two pi times i divided by r. So you'll hear me say mu naught over two pi i over r. Now what is mu naught? It is the magnetic permeability. It's how well the magnetic field can transmit through a vacuum. You might remember from electricity we have used epsilon naught at times and that was how well the electric field transmitted through a vacuum and that was the permittivity and this is the magnetic permeability mu naught has the value 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7th that's interesting the pi is in the in the value itself so mu naught is actually 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7th um, and that t stands for tesla so Tesla times meters divided by amperes. So the current in amperes, the R in meters, and the magnetic field strength in Tesla. So when you, when you do this equation, you'll see that the units are going to cancel out, and you'll be left with capital T Tesla, named after, of course, Nikola Tesla. So mu naught over 2 pi I over R. You'll notice since there's a pi in the mu naught, and there's a pi in the denominator, the pi's are going to cancel out. But this is just the way the uh, mu naught is stated as 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7th. So let's do an example calculation. We'll say, what is the magnetic field 3 centimeters from a wire with a current of 0 0.5 amps? Now, we have our equation B is mu naught over 2 pi I over R, so we need to identify what variables we have. Well, 0 0.5 amps is the current in the wire. That's letter I, 0 0.5 amps. R 3 centimeters is going to be R, the distance from the wire. And so instead of centimeters, we have to put that into meters so that the units will cancel out. We get 0 0.03 meters. And of course, mu naught, the magnetic permeability, has the value 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7th Tesla times meters divided by amps. If we plug that into the equation, B is mu naught over 2 pi I over R. We plug in 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7th Teslas times meters divided by amps as mu naught. I is 0 0.5 amps. The 2 pi remains and then the radius of 0 0.03 meters. What we notice is um, just for mathematical uh, ease of calculation, we can get rid of the pi. Pi will cancel out. That just keeps you from having to enter it into your calculator. And then the units, we see that meters and amps also cancel out, leaving us with Tesla, which is good because that's what we want for the strength of the magnetic field. So doing the calculations, we get 3.3 times 10 to the negative sixth Tesla. And the direction of that magnetic field, remember, if we take our right hand and we see that the current is moving to the right, we wrap our fingers around, we get to the bottom of the uh, wire, we see that the magnetic field is going to be going away from us. So we can use the right-hand rule to say that the direction of, the, of that magnetic field is pointed into the page. The next thing we're going to be introducing is the force on a moving charge in a uniform magnetic field. It turns out that a moving charge will generate its own field. Just like the current generates a field in circles, that moving charge is also in the process of generating a magnetic field in some sort of a circular pattern. And so here I've got a positive charge plus Q moving to the left with a certain velocity, V. Now, if I put a magnetic field and I have the charge generating a magnetic field of its own, what we're going to have is an interaction between the two magnetic fields. So the magnetic field generated by the charge that's moving as well as the magnetic field that it's interacting with. And so those two magnetic fields, just like two uh, magnets will interact in, a, in some way, these two magnetic fields are going to interact as well. 
what we do, what we see is it's going to create a force on the charge, and that force is going to be perpendicular to the magnetic field that it's in, as well as perpendicular to the velocity of the charge. So we have something that has a velocity and a force and a magnetic field, three things that are perpendicular to one another. In order to find actually that direction, uh, whether it's going to be up or down or um, you know, in which direction that force is, we're going to use another right-hand rule. So since the force on the charge is perpendicular to both the field and to the velocity, we can take our right hand and make uh, you know, that, that three-dimensional loser sign, I like to say, um, where we have our three fingers pointing out at uh, right angles to one another. Now, I like to say there are different versions of this, but I use the convention that the middle finger is going to be the direction of the magnetic field. So I like M for magnetic and also for the middle finger. The index finger is the direction of the current or the direction of the velocity of a positive charge. That way I can use I for the current as well as I for the index finger. So a positive charge is moving in the direction of the index finger. And then the thumb is like hitchhiking. Hey, I'm going that way. So the thumb for me is going to be the direction of the force on a positive charge. Now, if you do have a negative charge, you can still have your um, index finger being the direction the charge is moving. But if you have a negative charge, what you can do is you can actually use your left hand instead of your right hand. So you can use your left hand for an electron. You can say left electron um, is one way to remember it. But I use the direction of the force on the positive charge, so that's F. So we use our right hand rule in order to figure out the direction the force is going to be. And we'll do some examples of that later. It turns out that the magnitude of the force can also be calculated. And the magnitude of the force is going to depend on a couple things. It's going to depend upon the amount of charge, Q. It's going to depend upon the velocity, V. It's going to depend upon the strength of the magnetic field, B. And then there's this sine theta term. The reason we need a sine theta term is because it's only the component of the velocity that's perpendicular to the magnetic field that's going to contribute to the amount of force. So if the charge is moving in the same direction as the magnetic field lines, you're actually going to get zero force. You need the charge to be moving perpendicular to the magnetic field in order to be feeling the most force. So that sine theta, the way it works, is it's the angle between the velocity of the charge and the magnetic field. So it's only the component of the velocity perpendicular to the magnetic field that's going to affect the force. If the velocity is parallel to the magnetic field, then theta would be zero. So sine of zero would give me zero force. And then if the velocity is perpendicular to the B field, then you're going to get the maximum amount of force because theta would be 90 degrees and the sine of 90, of course, is one. So you will get the most force if you have the velocity perpendicular to the magnetic field. And that also lets you use that right-hand rule with your fingers pointing perpendicular to one another. So many examples, it'll be perpendicular. If you do have an angle, you've got to figure out the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field. Let's do an example problem. An electron flies into a magnetic field of 4.5 mt. mt would be milli tesla, or times 10 to the minus 3 tesla, at a 30 degree angle to the field. So the velocity is at a 30 degree angle to the field. That's going to be our theta. What velocity would produce a force of 8.5 times 10 to the negative 15th newtons on the electron? So we're given the force. Uh, the equation we're going to use is Fb, the magnetic force, equals QVB sine theta, where Q is the magnitude of the electric charge, V is the velocity, B is the magnetic field strength, and then sine theta, theta is the angle between V and B. If we, since we're looking for the velocity, we can divide everything by Q and B and sine theta and get that the velocity is the magnetic force, Fb, divided by QB sine theta. Now we can substitute values. The force that we're looking for is 8.5 times 10 to the negative 15th newtons. The charge is the charge on an electron, the magnitude of which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. So we substitute that for Q. The magnetic field strength was given as 4.5 mt. M is milli, so that's 4.5 millitesla, or 4.5 times 10 to the minus 3 tesla. And then 
sine theta, theta is given as 30 degrees, so we have sine 30 degrees. That gives a value of 2.36 times 10 to the seventh, and our units will be meters per second. Now, that is the velocity that it's traveling. What direction would that force be? In order to do that, what we need is to use our right-hand rule. But the right-hand rule is gives the velocity as the direction that a positive charge would be moving. Since this is an electron, let's use a left hand. So what we need is um, we need to figure out which where the component of the velocity is pointing. So before we can use that rule, let's take a look and let's turn this entire field towards us, um, you know, down towards us in the front, down this way. Um, if we turn that, then we have a top view of this field. So now we have a magnetic field going down and the velocity is coming off at an angle. So that would be our 30 degree angle. And we can complete a right triangle here where the opposite side is going to be the hypotenuse times the sine of theta. So here is V sine theta. It's the component of the velocity that is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Now let's move that velocity component back up into the top diagram. So now we have V sine theta. That's the direction of the component of the velocity that's perpendicular to the magnetic field, so that now we can have a perpendicular component to the magnetic field and to the velocity be the direction of our force, and that brings back the right-hand rule. Again, but since it's an electron, we're going to use a left-hand rule. Now, we're going to have to set this up, and excuse me as I get out of here, we have a velocity that's pointing to the right, we have a magnetic field that's pointing straight towards us. What that means is that using a left-hand rule, the, vo the force would be in a straight up direction. So velocity to the right, magnetic field pointing towards us, force would be straight up. So that gives us a force directed straight up. It turns out that the charge is going to move in a circular path. Why would that be? Well, if we have the charge entering the field, as soon as it enters the field, there's going to be a force that's perpendicular to the direction of the velocity. You should remember that just like the moon orbiting the Earth, the force is going to be directed towards the center of the Earth, and the velocity of the moon is perpendicular to um, the Earth in it as it rotates, and therefore that helps the moon move in a circular path around the Earth. So when we have a force that's perpendicular to the velocity, it's not going to be uh, linearly accelerating that object, making it go faster or slower, what it's going to do is it's going to accelerate it by changing the direction of that object. So since that force is perpendicular to the velocity, then it's going to change the direction of that charge. And now the charge is moving in a new direction. And so the force again is still perpendicular to that charge. And what that results in is circular motion as the charge moves through the field. So when we have a moving charge in a magnetic field, um, if the charge is moving perpendicular to the field, we're going to get a, a perfect circle of the direction of the charge. So that's a circular path of the charge through the field. If we have a sine theta in there, then it's only the component that's in the direct in, that's perpendicular to the magnetic field that's going to give us that circular path. The other component is going to keep the charge moving in that direction. So what you wind up is um, something that looks like a slinky. You get the spiral coming towards you or away from you as you have uh, some, some other component. But let's just talk perpendicular. We're going to get a nice circular motion. Now what we can do is we can take that circular motion and we can calculate something about it. It turns out that if we set the magnetic force that we're feeling equal to a centripetal force because we're moving in a circle, what that means is we can take the equations for the magnetic field and set it equal to, sorry, the magnetic force and set it equal to a centripetal force. Well, the equation for the magnetic force is QVB sine theta, but we're going to assume that it's in the plane right now, so uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field. So I dropped the sine theta. But we have QVB equal to mv squared over r, which was our equation for centripetal force that we learned before. Now we can take that equation and rearrange if we divide by QVB and we multiply by R, we get R equals MV squared over QVB. And I'm sure you can see what happens. The velocity in the top and the bottom, we're going to lose one of those velocities. So the squared will go away and the velocity in the bottom will go away, leaving us with the radius of the path is going to equal the mass of the object times its velocity divided by the amount of charge and the magnetic field. 
So we can calculate the radius of a circular path when we have a charge flying in a magnetic field based upon the mass and the velocity of the charge and the magnitude of the charge and the magnetic field strength. Now, this turns out to be very useful when we want to direct charges along a certain path um, where we would have a certain radius. So that's what we're calculating. Um, if we take a look at the Thomas Jefferson National Laboratory, this is uh, right down the road from us in, uh, in Virginia. And if we take a look at an aerial view, I just grabbed this from Google Maps, so this is credit Google Maps, you can actually see some of the key features of this particle accelerator. Um, what we have is a place where electrons are injected into the accelerator. Then those electrons, as they're flying along, they get accelerated by an electric field. So you'll have very strong electric fields that are causing those electrons to accelerate along that path. But in order to make them turn the corner, what you need is a magnetic field set up so that you can curve the path of those electrons. Once those electrons have made it to the other side, then you again have an electric field accelerating the electrons more to the left, and then they're actually going to go around another curve where a magnetic field will curve the path again. The electrons are going to travel around this ring, I don't know, up to five, six times. And then what they do is they fire a part of that beam, and that beam goes to several detectors, several targets out in um, you know, mounds of Earth uh, surrounding them to protect some of the, the, the radiation that will come off as those electrons hit targets. But um, we direct the electrons then to several different labs uh, where they have places where interesting things will happen. So you need the magnetic field in order to curve the path of those electrons as they go around the ring. So that is an application of the magnetic field changing the direction in a circular motion of the moving charge in the magnetic field. Hope that was useful and uh, go take a look at lecture number three.